This is a wonderful week that we celebrate as Christians. A lot to remember. This is Palm Sunday, and glad you're here. Uh, no other place we should rather be than the house of God, especially on Palm Sunday. Let's start off by opening in prayer. <clears throat> Precious Lord, we thank you, dear Lord, for this morning. We thank you for the privilege to gather. Lord, we thank you for as we think about what transpired this week, all that you went through for us. Thank you. Lord, we pray that you would challenge our hearts today, help us to have better understanding, and be more in awe of you because of it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Let's start by singing 103, Blessed Be the Name, 103. <clears throat> <laughs> All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for man to die, that he might man redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. All his name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where angels host adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the counselor, the mighty prince of peace. Of all earth's kingdoms conqueror, whose name shall never cease. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> Our scripture reading today is found in Matthew chapter 26. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 26, we'll start reading in verse 1. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and scribes, and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest, who was called Caphias, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtility and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of precious ointment, and poured it on his head, and sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye this woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. <clears throat> Let's pray for some of our folk that are sick. Um, let me update you. Patrick's uh, parents are, is it Holland? Yeah, Patrick's parents are in Holland. They're both sick with COVID. Pray for their recovery. 
It's uh, hitting them hard. They're still at home, there, but uh, they're having trouble. All right, let's, let's pray for some of our folks. Precious Lord, we thank you, dear Lord, for your love. We thank you for your care. Lord, we pray for our loved ones and, and family, Lord, that aren't able to be here today. We pray for Yvonne. Lord, we sure do miss Yvonne. Lord, and we pray that, that you would give her good days, that you would increase her appetite, help her to walk. Lord, we thank you that Russell's here, Lord, and we pray for his lungs to get stronger so that he can lift his voice in song as he desires. Lord, we pray for Heather, Lord, a 13-year-old young lady who's struggling with cancer. We pray for healing. We pray for the, her kidneys, Lord, which are uh, just uh, under a lot of risk with all the treatment. We pray that you would uh, prevent any permanent damage with the kidneys. Lord, we pray for Barbara Dill. We pray for good days. We pray for her heart. We pray for her, her movement and strength. And Lord, we pray just that you would, you would help her. Lord, and I think of my wife. I pray for Stacy. Lord, that you would give her appetite and strength. Lord, that you would take away the muscle spasms and pain and the pressure sores. Lord, and we pray for Myrtle as she recovers from her knee surgery. Lord, I pray that, that it's a good recovery. Lord, we pray that it's sooner. Uh, than expected. Lord, we'd love to see her sooner than six weeks. Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, and we do pray for uh, Patrick's parents. Lord, we thank you that his brother is recovering well. And we pray that his parents would recover well without any any uh, long, long-lasting uh, symptoms. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to put a hedge about our people here from the COVID. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. <clears throat> All right, for chorus time, uh, we're going to sing 186, the old rugged cross. Start by singing 186, and you say, brother, that's not a chorus. <laughs> this is a special week, amen. <laughs> so we'll sing two hymns rather than three choruses. 186, the old rugged cross. <clears throat> attraction for me for the dear lamb of god left his glory above to bear it to dark calvary so i'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last i lay down i will please was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will clean I will ever 
never be true. It shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross to my throne. couple pages over. 188. I guess one page over at the cross. Let me ask you to stand if you're able, please. 188. Alas, and did my sin bleed and did my sovereign die would he be both that sacred head for sin such as I at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am all the day was it for crimes that I have done he groaned upon the tree amazing pity grace unknown and love beyond decree at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day and the last. But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give my self away tis all that I can do at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day thank you you may be seated and good singing <clears throat> all right let me direct your attention to our bulletin. First of all, let me encourage you to come back for this evening. Now, I always encourage you to come back for this evening, but if you're not completely set in understanding that Jesus was crucified on Wednesday and know why you need to be here, let me just say that. Uh, there, there's over uh, 1.2 billion Catholics that are confused on this. There's over a billion Protestants that are confused on this. And a whole lot of Anabaptists, which we are part of, uh, are confused on this. Jesus was crucified on Wednesday. And we're going to get into that very thoroughly tonight, explaining that. So if you're not 100% unmovable, let me encourage you to make it a point to be here. Let me take you through Scripture. All right. Uh, you'll notice in your bulletin there's a nice calendar for the month of April. There are a lot of people born in April. Must be a good month. Um, but uh, thank you for putting the calendar together and the bulletin shared. Uh, we do have, uh, next week we are going to decorate the front with flowers that afterward you get to take home. If you would like to, to uh, purchase a flower, be part of that, 
there's order forms on the back. They need to be in this week. Um, please give them to Sharon. And there's different kinds, and I can't pronounce them. What were the kinds, Barbara? Hydrangeas, lilies, and something. Hyacinth. Tulip. You can replant them. <laughs> so, well, that, that needs to be in today, either this, this morning or tonight, the order forms. Um, now, let me encourage everyone. You'll notice in your bulletin that little picture of the Bible. It says, during the week, everyone is encouraged to read. Now, if you do not know, this is the Passion Week. This is the week of Jesus' suffering. And there's 25 chapters in the Bible devoted to this week in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, every year this week, I read through all these chapters again. Let me encourage you to make that part. You say, 25 is so much. It's like four chapters a day. Four and a half chapters a day. <laughs> Five. No, four, yeah, I mean, there's seven days. There's four chapters a day. Read, read, read them. Make it a point. Let me encourage you to do that. Um, also, June 6th through 8th, that's an important time. If you're able to be here, be here. That is our revival services. Uh, we have evangelist Bruce Miller that will be here. We have the Atlantic Coast Baptist College singers that will be here. You will be challenged. Uh, Bruce Miller is the one that taught my homiletics class, which is how to preach. Um, and, and he's a man of God that God has used many times uh, over, countless times. And uh, I hope to be used as much as him by the time my, my race is done. But let me encourage it. And also, if you have a moment, look on my Facebook. I put up a, a little three-minute post last night, a little video about revival. And there's a preacher that starts preaching about his desperate desire for the consuming fire of the Lord. In three minutes, he has to stop because the altar is full of people under conviction. That's what I'm praying for. You say, what do you mean by revival? That's what I mean. So we, we, we desperately need revival. Our time on this side of eternity is short. And I'm excited what God will do. So put that, make that a priority. Put that on your calendar. Um, now for the month of March, which is, uh, well, through tonight, we're focused on collecting uh, craft items for the kids uh, for Operation Christmas Child. Feel free to bring that in through any time of the year. That's just our focus for now. And then the thought for this week is to know lasting happiness we must get to know Jesus. And, and as Christopher comes, let me say praise God for the offering last week. Amen. So seldom do we meet budget, and we exceeded budget, uh, probably partly due to the stimulus checks. Um, but keep being faithful givers like God instructs us to be. Uh, brother. Thank you, dear Lord, for everything you do for us each and every day. Thank you for your wonderful love through Jesus Christ. Praise you for our families, for our church family, and for this beautiful building that we come to to worship you. And we pray for healing. We thank you for the healing that you've done and that that you will do. We praise you for the word of God, and we pray that you'd open our hearts to a message you have for us this day. And we thank you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
As you turn your hymn book to 88, Ferris Lord Jesus, there's one announcement I forgot. Not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. On April 11th, we are having a baptismal service. Now, we have two lined up to be baptized, uh, another one interested. If you would like to be baptized, and you say, what, what do I need to be baptized? First of all, if you know you're born again, you've been saved, you're, you don't have any question about that, you're saved. One of the first things we're supposed to do as believers is follow the Lord in believer's baptism. He provided the example, and we do that to show that we're desiring to fire, follow him uh, in our lives. We, we, it represents the burial of Christ, the death burial, and then resurrection of Christ. And it also represents we were dead in our trespasses of sin and raised to newness of life. Um, so if you're interested in being baptized uh, and you need to be baptized, you haven't been baptized yet, see me. That's two weeks from now. All right. Number 88, Ferris Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O Thou God and man, the Son, Thee will I cherish, Thee will I honor, Thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown. shines brighter, Jesus shines pure, and all the angel heaven can boast. Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son. seated. <clears throat> I think you've picked up from now, by now, that we're taking a brief pause, uh, a two-week pause from the book of Genesis, uh, in our study of the Je book of Genesis. Uh, God laid on my heart to combine many principles that I've taught over the years and preached over the years here and make a visual out of them. Because as we taught through the, the feast and as we taught through the, the, the week of the crucifixion and, and stuff, I've never seen it all overlaid. And as I was studying again this week, God just made it so plain. So I rushed and made a chart rather than hundreds of hours in about 20 hours. <laughs> so it will be more developed next week. Um, but it, it is a, a tool that I will use at various teaching times uh, when we open up Sunday school again here shortly. Now, to the, this morning's message, you know, th this is an important time of year. It's an important time of year for the Jewish faith, and it's the important time of the year for the Christian faith alike. Now, the Jewish people, as they observe the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they look back to the time where, Jesus, or where, where God brought them from Egypt and used Moses to transform them from slavery to freedom as they crossed the Red Sea. 
They look back to the Passover lamb that was spread on the door mantle. And God instructed them the, the feast of the Passover and unleavened bread and, and how to observe that. Christians recognize this week. As, as we look back, we look back to this is the week that Jesus Christ went to the cross. This is the week that, that, that he suffered on the cross. You sometimes refer to it here as passion. Um, it, it's derived from a Greek verb, pasho, which means to suffer. And that's, that's why it's referred to as, as the, the Passion Week. But it began with his triumphal entry, and we know next week it ends with his resurrection. This is the most important week uh, of what happened in the life of Jesus and of what affects us today is what transpires this week. Some of you notice my tie. It's got a picture of the, most of the Passion Week, the temptation into the prayer in the garden and stuff like that. This is Pastor Cunningham's tie, my pastor. And uh, I said to somebody this morning, I said, this is my, his only tie that I had that didn't have mustard or ketchup right here. <laughs> but uh, I, I, when, I, when I candidated about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 11 years ago, in, in uh, Illinois to, to pastor there, when I candidated, I wore this. And when I candidated here, I wore this. Why? You just... When I ask God to help mature me and give me wisdom, I ask God a lot of ways to, to make me like Pastor Cunningham because he was a pastor. He just had a heart and love and care and compassion for people. And God, in his sense of humor, he made me like Pastor Cunningham's shape. <laughs> Yes, he was shaped like me. I didn't used to be shaped like this, but <laughs> be careful how you pray. <laughs> well, the, so this is an important week. Uh, um, Acts chapter 1, verse 3 says this, To whom also he showed himself alive after the passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So passion is a biblical term. Um, now, I must admit that the Catholic Church tries to claim it and say it's not from, from Pasho, but it, they say a Latin word and they say it's derived from the Latin. Nope, it's derived from Greek. <laughs> it, it comes from the Bible. Uh, now, if, if ever there is a week in the Bible that Christians ought to take extra care in, in, in laying out and understanding, this is it. Like I said in the announcements, the Bible devotes 25 chapters to 10 days. 25 chapters in the life of Jesus to these 10 days. So the, the, this morning, uh, the, the three days previous and then all the way to next Sunday, 25 chapters. So this morning we're going to focus on, on, on the first stage of the Passion Week is revealed in the Gospel of John. And then later this evening we'll, we'll dig further into the day and the time and the confusion about when Jesus Christ was crucified. Um, title of this evening, or this morning's message is On His Way to the Cross. Let's pray. Precious Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the, the fact that you went to the cross. We thank you that you, you died to pay the price for us. Thank you for your love and your patience. Lord, we pray now that you would use the message to inspire and challenge and, and just increase the faith and adoration of your believers. And Lord, for those that don't know you as Savior, Lord, whether they're here or whether they're listening at the Internet, we pray that today would be the day that they understand today would be the day they ask Jesus to save them, Lord, and quit making excuses but got saved. Lord, we ask for that, and we ask you to use this time. Please give clarity while I preach. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Our main passage today is in John chapter 12. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 1. We'll read the first 17 verses. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. <clears throat> there they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why wast thou not 
Why was this ointment not sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the bag, and bear what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing has she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but for me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but also them that might seek Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Verse 12. On the next day much people that were come to the feast, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they these things which were written of him, that they had done these things unto him. In verse 17, The people therefore that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. <clears throat> this morning we'll examine three evident exhi exhibitions of love that lead up to the day of the cross. We'll see three exhibitions of love um, We'll, we'll, we'll look and focus at this time, about 2,000 years ago, on, the, on the, this day when Jesus, uh, the week Jesus went to the cross. So on his way to the cross, Jesus was approaching the day of his crucifixion. Our text says that, that he made his way to Bethany. Bethany was a little, little while outside of Jerusalem, just a little south. And Bethany is where he lays dress, where he, where he raised <laughs> raised Lazarus from the grave. It, it was a place that he would spend a lot of time with. On his way to the cross, the first uh, evident exhibition of love is Mary acted out of love for Jesus. Mary acted out of love for Jesus. Look at verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Now let me say, notice the timing. When God gives us time, it's important for us to understand. God doesn't give us a time when Jesus was born. We don't know the actual day when Jesus came. I would venture to say it was any day that Jesus was born other than December 25th. But the day is not important. It's, it's important that we celebrate that he was born. But the day that he went to the cross, God gives us some exact specifics. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. So Jesus arrives in Bethany six days before the Passover. Now, the Passover in the book of Exodus and Leviticus is identified on the 14th day of the first month. Now, the first month in the Hebrew calendar is Nisan. Sometimes it's said Nisan. I listened to three different Hebrew pronouncers, and it gave me three different ways. They said Nisan, Nisan, and, and uh, I forgot the third one. But third, so understand, this, this is representing most of the month of Nisan, uh, or Nisan, whatever you want to call it, and approximately the Hebrew year, 37 A.D., 3789 A.D. Now, the Hebrew calendar is a little different than the Gregorian calendar, which we have today. If you've got this year's alpaca calendar, it is a Gregorian calendar. Well, the Hebrews' years, they count from the day of creation, and it's approximately 3789. I say approximately, because again, very solid calculations come to 3789 all the way to 3793. You say, what's so difficult? It should be easy to calculate. Well, when the Jews come to a year where the numbers intimidate them, like year 666, for example, they just skip it. So there's not an algorithm, although if you go to Google and you search year conversion, year conversion, if you put year 
uh, 31 B.C. or 4 B.C. It'll tell you this is the Hebrew year, but in all honesty, a straight mathematical algorithm will not calculate what year the Hebrews actually look at it is. So, 3789, I went with that because that is uh, calculating in Daniel 12, the 70 weeks, the prophecy of the 70 weeks and how much before the Messiah comes, and we know that year. So that's where 3789 comes from. But anyway, the Jewish day, the 14th of Nisan, is the Passover. And the 15th of Nisan starts a seven-week feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now you'll see some unusual things about this calendar here, which is why I did this. I was trying to figure out a way to make this visually understandable. And this is what causes people confusion. The straight lines represent the days that we would normally conceive as, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That is not how the Jews keep time. The Jews keep time from night to day. The day crosses, or the, the next day happens at sundown. Now, I did not paint the night black because I can't write on black. So I have it white. White is night. Just remember that. White is night as we're, we're understanding this. Now, the first month is the month of Nisan. And what starts the month of Nisan is the new moon. Almost to what we have outside. We have a little more black. I was looking at it last night outside and I was like, I painted the moon the wrong color. <laughs> you get it. You understand. So when, the, when that would come, they would know this is the start of the first year. This is the start of the month of Nisan. And, and the week or the month Jesus was crucified, that first day happened to be our Thursday. So it started here, though. Is that Thursday, Monday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday? It started at night, and it carried on through the day. That was day one. That's the new moon. And that's also called Rosh Hashan. That's what the Hebrews call New Year. And there's another name for a new moon, Rosh. I forgot. <laughs> but that's so. Th that's how you read. This is one day, and it starts at the night and goes to the day. Now, in order to further cause clarification, I made the Sabbath days blue. Now, every week on Saturday, this being Saturday, would be a Sabbath. Sabbath, Sabbath, Sabbath. This would be the seventh day. It starts on Friday night at sundown. It carries on through Saturday night at sundown. Once sun goes down, guess what? They consider that Sunday through the night. You see where some of the confusion is coming from, and, and I want you to get a visual uh, of how the days uh, work. So we see the timing. It says, Jesus arrived in Bethany six days before the Passover, six days before Nisan, which means... Uh, on, uh, on Nisan, Nisan the, the 8th, is when Jesus arrived in Bethany. So that's the first day that Jesus, that God's word identifies as to where he was. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Now the next thing that we see is Jesus ate supper. Now our mind says, okay, he arrived here. On the 8th, must be supper on the, the, the ninth. you know. Nope. It doesn't tell about every meal. The meal that it's actually referring to is this here. It's on the Sabbath. It's a meal of Sabbath. Not every meal that we eat is notable. Not every meal that Jesus ate is notable. But God identifies where that is a little farther in our passage. How do we know this meal was on the Sabbath? Well... There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table. Now, this must have been a special supper. Lazarus, who hadn't been raised from the grave that long. You have the disciples. You have Jesus, who, who is, who's prepared and going to the cross and giving, uh, starting to give his final uh, recommendations and encouragements and instructions to his disciples. Now, it's not the Last Supper, but it's an important one. And it says in verse 3, 
Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with it with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of his ointment. So the next thing we see is at this meal, after they're done eating, Mary, Lazarus' brother, comes up to Jesus, comes to his feet, and, 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 and point, puts a very uh, precious, expensive ointment on his feet. And as she's there crying and weeping, now Mary has this understanding what Jesus is about to do. Mary understands that it's for his burial. So she's there and she's even wiping it with his hair because she doesn't have a tissue handy. It says, then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Now drop down to verse 7. There starts to be some contention, and, and Jesus says, Leave her alone. She hath done this for my burial. She, and Jesus said, Let her alone against the day of my burying. Has she kept this? What it's saying is, Mary set this aside for my burial. She understood that his burial was at hand. She had a better grasp of what would transpire this week than the disciples. She understood that. Now skip down to verse 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, the next day. Now, here's the next context of time. The next day. The next verse tells us what happens on the next day. The triumphal entry. So we know that Mary anointed the feet of Jesus here. The Passover lamb is set aside. Now we'll, we'll examine tonight what the Passover lamb being set aside. But let me say, the Passover lamb, getting ready for, for the 14th and, and this in, the, the Passover feast, they would separate a lamb, they would bring it into the home, and they would observe it. Close examination, they'd make sure it had no deformities, no blemishes, no diseases. They'd make sure that it's spotless and perfect in every way. And then as the Passover came, then again the priest would inspect it before the sacrifice was made. Jesus Christ, he's brought into the home and the most intimate thing is the lamb is set aside. He, he, he's inspected by, by the disciples and those closest to him, then the next thing we see is that, that, that he's publicly brought out and he's inspected by the people of Israel as he's in the temple day after day after day. And then in the trials, as he's being trialed, he's inspected by Pilate, he's inspected by Cassius, he's inspected by the priest, and they found no fault in him. Amen? So we notice the timing. Next thing, Mary acted out of love. Notice the purpose. Verse 7, then, then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing has she kept this. Now it was custom in Jewish times because they didn't have from mouth to hide and, and, and do what we do today. It was custom that when someone would pass away that they would anoint the body with uh, fragrances. Most often myrrh, myrrh and other spices. They would do that, the family would do that as a way to show love and, 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 and anoint, the, anoint the body. It was unheard of to do before because people were still alive. Well, here she doesn't use a more common, less expensive uh, perfume as myrrh. Here she uses a, a expensive ointments and it says... Uh, um, let her alone against the day of my burying has she kept this. This was much more valuable. He was still alive. She gave her best to Jesus to show her love and appreciation for him. Jesus, you've done so much in my life. We lost our parents years ago, but since you've come into our life, Mary, Martha, or Martha, myself, and Lazarus, wow, do we have something special. And then when Lazarus got sick and we thought our life was going to fall apart, you brought him back to us. And, and, and she, she's got this heart devotion. She wanted to be a blessing. To, she wanted to be a blessing while Jesus was still alive. Now there's a good takeaway here. 
Don't let opportunities to pour out affection on, on God pass you by. They're not as frequent as you might think. When you have opportunities to lift your voice and make a joyful noise, lift your voice and make a joyful noise. When God pulls on your heart to, to give to a special need, give to a special need. It's our way of showing when God tugs on your heart to share the gospel in God's love with someone, share the gospel in God's love. She wanted to be a blessing while she still could. Mary acted out of love. We see the timing, the purpose. Next we see the results. Notice the results. Skip over to Matthew chapter 26. Now we'll get back to John chapter 12. If you need to keep your finger there. But Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Notice the results. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. Now Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper a couple days later. Jesus, he's here at Mary's house. She anointed the feet. She poured out her, her blessing, her sacrifice to him. Then he has a triumphal entry. Then, then the evening of the triumphal entry, um, Jesus is at the house of Simon the lepers back in Bethany. He, he came to Bethany, came to have dinner of Simon the leper. Now, Simon was not plagued with leprosy. Simon used to be plagued with leprosy. Jesus healed him. He's identified as Simon the leper to see that, look... Simon was walking dead. He was a dead man walking. Leprosy was uncurable. They had no way. The only cure for leprosy was God to do a miraculous intervention. And here's Simon. He had that, the, 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 the disease of leprosy. It was uncurable. And Jesus cleared, uh, cleared him up. Jesus gave him life. Jesus restored his life back to him. And now he's at his house at a later time. Now when Jesus was in the house of Bethany, the Simon the leper, verse 7, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. So now as he's at, the, at the lep, uh, Simon the leper's house, a woman comes with a, an alabaster box. Evidently, it's some stone box that's been ornately carved and dug. It, it, it's a good place for spices and, and perfumes because it wouldn't absorb the aroma like wood or clay would. It, 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 and you get the idea. It's very expensive and precious. But what's inside it is the most precious. And she comes and she opens it up and now she puts it on Jesus' head. Once again, I illustrate this because for years, not weeks, years, I read this and the woman anointing Jesus' head as the same topic. It's not. Here, he's at Mary's house. Here, he's at Simon's house. Here, Mary anoints the feet. Here, this woman anoints the head. The result of Mary pouring out her act of love and affection on Jesus, evidently provided an example and inspired another to where a couple days later, another who loved Jesus and cared for Jesus did the same thing. When we sacrificially pour out our love and we do what we can for the Lord, it inspires and challenges others. Oh, if we can get hold of that. Our acts of love and service God uses and multiplies and inspires other Christians to do the same. What was the woman's name? I don't know. Not sure. Doesn't matter. Every time we talk about the gospel, we talk about her. We see the action that is done as memorial. Verse 8 of Matthew 26 Verse 8, but when the disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? Second time. In a couple days. The first time they, 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 they struggled with it. Wow, we could have done a lot with that money. Especially Judas. Now it's a couple days later, it's happening again. And they entertain the thought, 
what's going on here? If these expensive, lavish gifts are poured out every couple days, for this ointment might have been sold for much and then given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye this woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but, ye have, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever the gospel shall be preached to the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Now I like this. The disciples needed to have the same lesson repeated to them. The reason why I like that is because oftentimes in my spiritual walk, I need the same lesson taught to me by God over and over again. God. Jesus said in, in, to Mary, leave her alone. She has done this for a good thing. A couple days later, more circumstances. Now there, there's some more confusion. Leave her alone. She has done this for my burial. <clears throat> Mary acted out of love for Jesus. The next thing we see is others acted out of selfishness. Others acted out of selfishness. Verse 4 says, Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simeon's son, which should betray him. The first one that we look at, we come to in our passage that acted out of selfishness, is the traitor. The traitor, Judas, the traitor. Verse 5, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence? We are back in, in John, by the way. <laughs> I should say that, John chapter 12. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Then he said, not that he cared for the poor, but that he was a thief and had it a bag and bare what was put therein. Judas didn't care for the poor. He might have cared for the poor a little, but he did not care for the poor as much as he cared for the money. He wanted the money. He, he was a treasure, and he felt as a treasure, I have some say, some more influence of what's in the bag. It says, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag. He knew that if there was money in the bag, he could manipulate it to his benefit. I'm thankful for trustworthy treasurers. <laughs> I really am. I, I, I've definitely heard of a number of stories where treasurers were, were stealing, and, and I'm thankful for trustworthy treasurers. A couple days later, uh, skip down to verse 14. A couple days later, as we come to the house of Simeon, Verse 14 of Matthew 26 again. <laughs> Got to flip our pages. Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will ye give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they connived with, with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Here at the dinner with Simeon, he leaves. Here is when Judas makes a deal. The day after the triumphal entry, the night after the triumphal entry, the new Jewish day. It's when he goes to make a deal with the chief priest. It says from that time, he, he, he planned, he plotted how to deliver Jesus. It's clear that Judas' action, his actions show that he loved money. Now we see uh, Judas loved money. Well, next, consider the religious. Back to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 9. Much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there. And there came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. So the news had gotten out. Jesus is at Bethany, uh, and Jesus is, is coming and is taking us back here. And the news had gotten out that a lot of people came to see Jesus, and not only Jesus, but Lazarus also. <clears throat> Verse 
the news had gotten out and they'd come for several reasons. Many of the people came to see Jesus. Some of them might have been healed. Some of them might have had a loved one healed. Some of them just might have, they came to see Jesus. They, they, certainly the rumors and the thoughts were, were possibly he's the Messiah. See the Messiah and their idea of the Messiah was that he would come with military might. Their idea of the Messiah is that the Messiah would come and overthrow Rome, Rome that had ruled over them for over 90 years. In verse 9 he continues, And they came not only for Jesus' sake, for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus, whom they had raised from the dead. So they came to see Jesus. They came to see Lazarus. It's spectacular. What could one who had died and been dead for a couple days tell us about life after? What can he tell us about heaven? What can he tell us about the angels? Or if he went, what can he tell us about hell? They, want, they were curious. It had gotten around. Lazarus was dead, but there's a lot of witnesses that saw him raised out of the grave. Surely he would have something interesting to say. Some came simply for a social occasion. Wherever Jesus was, it was broadcast, it was publicized, there were multitudes, and it was the place to be. Literally everybody's going to be there. If you're not there, you're not cool. Well, they didn't say that back in the Bible's day. Verse 10, But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to death also. Now we know from the Gospels that the chief priests, and, and, and they had already been conspiring together. The previous chief priests and Cathias, Cathias, Cathias um, had been conspiring together, so the, the current and the previous chief priest, uh, of, of how to get rid of Jesus. They were already planned on killing him, planned on tripping him up, planned on getting him to say blasphemy or something. Now they're like, Lazarus' testimony, too, is also drawing people to Jesus. We need to get rid of him. <clears throat> so they plan to destroy Jesus and Lazarus. They decided to remove all the life-changing evidence that Jesus did. Um, if we can't get rid of the miracles, certainly we could belittle them. Certainly we can make people forget about him, and we, we can control Lazarus. He, he's already alive, but we can certainly keep him from testifying. We can shut him up, literally by killing him. The religious leaders were jealous about spiritual control. They liked everyone to look up to them and think, wow, they're holy. Wow, they're special. Wow, they're right with God. And now they're, those that they influenced for years were following Jesus. They were jealous uh, of Jesus. They, they were jealous about spiritual control. Now, I should say that their idea, their plan was to silence Lazarus by killing him. Satan is very clear about his plan of silencing Christians. I say that because once you get saved, Satan looks at you and says, they're saved. I can't, I can't get them unsaved. They're secure. But I can certainly keep them from sharing the faith. I can entice them with distractions. I can entice them with sin. I can entice them with attacks from other people to keep them from sharing the faith. So just like their idea of silencing Lazarus, understand some here may have been silenced to where you're not sharing the wonderful news with anybody else. Ephesians 6.12 tells us, our, our, it says, for, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is all of Satan's armies organized and meticulous and largely focused on keeping Christians silent about sharing the gospel. Well, back to verse 11. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. They used to come to us. Now they're going to Jesus because of Lazarus. He must die. Needs to be silenced. Like Judas, the high priests were selfish. 
They, they, they love themselves. What did the high priest exhibit their love here? They loved the, the power and the influence they wielded over people. They were losing power and influence so that they, during this triumphal entry in this week, they were exhibiting their love for power and influence. Matthew 26, 14 and 15, you don't need to turn there. It says that one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. Judas loved money. He was glad to get the money. The chief priests were glad to get rid of Jesus. They were glad to give Judas the money. We see the traitor. We see the religious. The others acted in selfishness. Now we see the majority. The majority. Back to John chapter 12. John 12, 12 says, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming, all over from Galilee to South Judea, all over people were in Jerusalem for the feast as God instructed them. And it's saying now when much people, as Jerusalem is shoulder to shoulder, it's, it's where the temple is, it's where everybody is instructed by Mosaic law to come, um, they're there. They're, they're there to worship and observe the feast, uh, the feast of Passover and the feast of unleavened bread as God instructs. And the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, word got around, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Back to our chart here. You have... Mary anointing the fate of Jesus. That day is the weekly Sabbath. The Passover lamb is set aside to be observed. On the next day, now this is night, so the next day is Jesus' triumphal entry. The huge mass that had heard that Jesus was coming, the many people that had seen and listened to him, and the many people that heard from people that had seen and listened to him, they, the rumors were he's coming as the Messiah. And they started cutting down palm branches and waving them. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that many took off their coats and threw their coats. I don't want to do that because I'll unhook my lapel. They, they threw their coats down on the ground and the multitude is shouting and waving palm branches. That's why it's called Palm Sunday. This day. Verse 13, took the palm branches and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Hosanna means save us now. Save now. Bless now. Heap favor on me now. Now it's kind of foreign to us today, but palm branches in that day were a sign of triumph and victory. It was common after a conflict and a victorious king would come back that they would wave palm branches. Or when they were going to a war and they were, were counting on victory, they would wave palm branches. And it was showing victory, victory, victoria, victory and triumph. It was custom to uh, wave it as a victorious king would come back. Waving for their king. Now, today, we don't really use palm branches. Now, I, I have a friend in India that, uh, that I've been uh, encouraging and mentoring, and he sent me a picture at 5 o'clock this morning of his palm service. Now, they're, I think, 13 hours ahead of us. And had all the kids with palm branches and stuff. It was cute. Indian pastor. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, yeah, today... You, <laughs> You could see Russell and Jim, uh, uh, if, if the Buffalo Bills made it to the Super Bowl, I think Jim and Russell would have been sitting in front of the TV bagging church and have blue and white and maybe a little bit of red on their face holding up a foam finger. We're number one. We're number one. <laughs> well, <laughs> 
as I was studying for this morning's message, I read an account of a little boy that was sick on Palm Sunday, so he stayed home with his mom. His mom stayed home, and his father returned from church, and he was holding a palm branch. And the little boy was curious. He asked, why do you have the palm branch, Dad? <laughs> the father replied, you see, when Jesus came into town, everyone waved palm branches to honor him. So we got this palm branch today. The boy's response, oh, shucks. The one Sunday I missed Sunday, and that's the Sunday Jesus shows up. <laughs> 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 well, as they waved the palm branches, they were welcoming Jesus as, as, as a great conqueror and the deliverer. They, they, they waved the palm branches uh, saying, Hosanna, save now, bless now. They're saying, deliver me from Roman rule. Their conception of what the Messiah would be, they thought he would come as a victorious king. And they, they, they wanted, save now, free us up. Now that reveals some of what they loved. So we're talking about the love. Give me what I want now. Hosanna. It's different from the idea. They're saying, Hosanna. Don't let us serve. Don't make us in subjection to these Roman Gentiles anymore. A Gentile is anybody that's not a Jew. That's what a Gentile is. Uh, don't make us subjective to these sub Gentiles anymore. Give us earthly freedoms. The idea, and so many people say they, they get saved and they come to Christ, but they come to Christ, Jesus, give me what I want. Sure, I'll pray to you. Give me what I want. No. It's not coming to Jesus to say, give me what I want, like they were crying, Hosanna. It, it's Jesus I give you my trust. I put my trust in you, not Jesus. I trust you to give me what I want. We're not receiving Jesus for physical needs, but because we have a spiritual need. We want to be spiritual. But here the majority's action reveal what they love. Um, the, the first one would be uh, many, many love their country. There was a national pride. It's not likely that any of them were still alive there shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, that, that had been there before Roman rule. But they knew they had to pay taxes to Roman rules. That's why tax collectors were so looked down. They, 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 they had to pay taxes and they, and they were, were subject. They didn't want to be subjugated to Rome any longer. They, they loved their country. Um, so they were anticipating a revolt against Rome. Some shouted, Hosanna. Um, they, were, they were expressing the, the, their love for money. You say, what do you mean? Well, Hosanna, revolt over revolt from, from Rome, or break free from Rome, get our country back. In their minds are saying, we have, no longer have to pay so much exorbitant money to Rome. So yes, I love my country. Yes, I love my money. Now, it's likely that many that said Hosanna were expressing a love for Jesus. But let me also say that that love was pretty shallow. Probably not priority. It was finicky because they, they loved the idea of him coming in as conquering king. But just a couple days later from the triumphal entry on Sunday to Wednesday at the Passover and, and the, the, the trials, what did they cry to Pilate? Give us Barabbas! Give us Barabbas! When they see the beaten, broken body of Jesus, no longer do they picture him as a valiant conqueror. Finicky. Their actions don't represent love for Christ. Mary acted out of love for Jesus. Others acted out of selfishness. Jesus acted out of love for others. That's the third point if you're taking notes. Jesus acted out of love for others. First of all, he came peacefully. Verse 14, And when Jesus was, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, the king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. Now Jesus' intention of coming into Jerusalem is made clear by him coming in on a young donkey. There are some beautiful pictures and symbolism. The, the, the colt was a symbol of peace. 
when someone would come in, when a king or a magistrate or a ruler uh, or ambassador would come into an area and they would be riding a donkey, it was a symbol, we come with peaceful intentions. We come to make peace with you. Now, when a king came to conquer or when a king came back victorious or when a king came to, to incite people for war, they would come riding in on a stallion. That would represent we're going to battle. Jesus was representing that he came to bring peace. Romans 5.1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, indeed, Jesus came to bring peace. The cult isn't only a symbol of peace, it's also a symbol of service. It's a noble animal. It was used to carry man's burdens. And this, this, uh, this animal, uh, as Jesus wrote in, Jesus came to bear man's burdens so that we can lay our burdens and the weight of our sin and our, and our, before Him and let Him carry them for us. This cult symbolized sacredness. It was specific in the Gospels that, that it was a, a cult that, that, that had never been written. That, that it was pure, that it, that it was sacred. Luke 19.30 say, Go ye into the village over against you, into the which at the entering ye shall find a colt tied, wherein yet never a man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. Animals used for religious purposes couldn't have been used for anything else before. God expresses that deliberately to show us that, that nothing that Jesus did was by accident. He wanted to show us that, that He came to bring peace. He came to, to, to bear burdens. He came to, for worship, for a God-honoring service. Not only did he come peacefully, he came publicly. He came publicly. Look at verse uh, Matthew 21. We haven't been to Matthew 21 yet. Matthew 21 is the, uh, a sister passage to what we've been looking at in John. Uh, Matthew 21, 8 through 10. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from trees and strawed them in the way. Verse 9. And the multitudes that went before and followed cried, Hosanna, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. He came publicly. Verse 8 tells us a very great multitude. That's a lot. Verse 9 tells us the multitudes heralded his coming. Not only did, was there a great multitude, but the multitudes are saying, Jesus is coming, get ready. And others were saying, Jesus is coming, get ready. Verse 10. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? There was so much public awareness of Jesus' coming that those who didn't know asked, what's all the hubbub? Who's coming? Jesus. Jesus is coming? Did you hear Jesus is coming? What? Jesus is Everyone, it caused the whole city. In verse 11, And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophets of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and brought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall not be called, shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. He went publicly. He came in, and as he's coming into, the, coming into Jerusalem, everybody's heralding the great multitude. And then he comes, and, and he, um, the, the, the next day, or the triumphal entry, he goes into the temple. He goes into the court of Gentiles through the first door. And, and where is supposed to be a point where Gentiles can come, and that's as far as they can come to the throne of God. The Jews had made it a money changer. They had made it a flea market. And Jesus doesn't come quietly. He doesn't hide himself. He doesn't seek. Everybody's broadcasting. And then he goes to the center of the city, the center of worship, and he starts throwing off money changers in the temple. Everybody knew he was there. He was very public. 
He didn't try to sneak in. Philippians 2 7. Or, not yet. Um, next, he came prepared. Thirdly, he came prepared. Matthew 20, 28 says this, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to give his life a ransom for many. Before Jesus came in the triumphal entry, he, he expressed, look, that Jesus didn't come to be ministered to. He came to give his life a ransom for many. He was prepared. He was ready. Um, uh, he came with the intention Prepared to, for the horrible torture. As I go to Jerusalem, as I'm lifted up, as I'm hung on the cross, I will be tortured and beaten. He was prepared. Why? Because he knew that that would ransom many from their sin debt. Philippians 2, 7 and 8 says this, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made into the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus Christ, he had already left the glory of heaven. He had already taken on the form of a servant. He had already uh, been fashioned into a man. Never ceased to be God, all God, all man. Now he's prepared, to en he's prepared to endure the sufferings that lie ahead in just a couple days. He came prepared, he came publicly, he came peacefully. At first the disciples didn't understand. They didn't understand, they, they were confused. It wasn't until after the resurrection that all these things came to connect the dots. After... The, the Passion Week, after the suffering, after the resurrection, that's when they all came to faith and put their faith and trust in Christ. They yielded to the Holy Spirit's loving tug. Now thankfully today we see the whole view. We know the end of the story. We know the resurrection. We know all those many hundreds of witnesses that saw Him for 40 days and 40 nights. As we come to close today, our focus this morning has been on people's motives during the triumphal entry of Christ. Mary was motivated by love. The mass amount of people were motivated by selfishness. Whether it be the religious zeal for the popularity, they loved the, the applause or, or, or the people's love for their country or freedom. But we see Jesus was motivated by love for others. You know, Jesus entered into Jerusalem about 2,000 years ago. He came into Jerusalem, give or take a few years. Let me ask you a question. Has he come into your heart? Can you look back to that time when you realized that you have no hope without him? You might have had a misconception before like the people did. They were crying, Hosanna, save us now, deliver us now. They didn't realize the cross and what Jesus was doing. But have you come to the point where you realize that, look, you are without hope. You are found guilty in the sight of a, loving, a holy God. God loves you, but he is holy. He must punish sin. Either he takes out that punishment on you for all eternity or he places that infinite amount of punishment and torment on the infinite God, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ came into Jerusalem. Has he come into your heart? I remember at the end of a church service, uh, when I was 16, I came forward. It was like 1992, I think, 91, the fall of 91. Can you look back to a time where you learned that you needed to get saved and you acted upon it. You asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior to come into your heart and save you. If you haven't done that, if you haven't placed all your trust on Him, um, you need to do that. You need to act upon. If you believe that, that Jesus Christ died and that His death and burial and resurrection, what we look at this week, 
is for you. If you haven't received that yet, you need to do that today. God says the way that we do that is to believe in our heart and then because of that belief, confess with our mouth. And that's asking Him to save us. In just a second, we're going to have an invitation. If that's you, you need to come. Say, Pastor, I need to talk with someone. Secondly, Christian, I know the testimony of just about everybody in here. Have you been silenced? They wanted to silence Lazarus. That's not a new trick of Satan. A lot of Christians, they don't share their faith. They don't witness. They don't even give out a gospel tract. We have some wonderful gospel tracts. Why did Jesus die on the cross? You should hand that out this week. Have you been sharing your faith? Or have you been silenced? Maybe as we sing, you need to confess to God, God, forgive me, give me boldness. Help me to share your love. Help me to share. Use me to show others your heart. Please turn with me as we stand to 185. When I survey the wondrous cross, 185. Respond as God would have you to respond. 185. that last verse were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small love so amazing so divine demands my soul my life my all keep Jesus at the forefront of your mind as we travel through the week think about what Jesus endured this week when he was on the cross and as he was laid in the grave for you Let's close in prayer. Precious Lord, we thank you, dear Lord, for your love. Lord, we thank you for your your triumphal entry. Lord, for you did it out of love. Lord, you were prepared to go to the cross for us, and we thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for the many testimonies in here of those that have put their trust in you. We thank you for your so great a salvation. Lord, as we leave these doors, we ask that you would help us to be bold this week. Help us to show you love by sharing your love with others. Thank you for today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You're dismissed.